My name is Kate Pipping and this is a pathophysiology video on non-ST elevation myocardial infarction and STEMI and ST elevation myocardial infarction STEMI. As usual, we're going to talk about um, what is STEMI and STEMI, the symptoms, pathophysiology and etiology, clinical examination and history, so off key tip, and we're going to have a summary and then go over those questions again. Now, n STEMI and STEMI, myocardial infarction is a very important topic in medicine. It's something that you would definitely come across during your career. And approximately one quarter of deaths in males and one fifth of females in the UK are attributable to ischemic heart disease. Um, and 20% of patients who suffer a myocardial infarction still die before reaching hospital. We need to start with some questions and find out what you already know. So what is the common presentation of a myocardial infarction? Um, and again, it's a very common exam question, something you should be aware of. Is it chest pain or discomfort that may travel into the arm, shoulder, back, neck or jaw? Is it dysphagia, which is difficult to follow? Is it wheezing and shortness of breath? Uh, is it headache, fatigue and irritability? And the answer is chest pain and discomfort that may travel into the arm, shoulder, back, neck, or jaw. And it's usually the left arm, shoulder, neck, back, or jaw. Okay, and what is raised in the blood of a patient who has had a myocardial infarction? Is it glucagon? Is it anti TCG antibodies? Troponin? Or HCG? And the best way to learn these um, is to, when you're on clinical placement, is to go on a wall exam. Uh, first thing in the morning, follow the doctor and ask lots of questions. And with permission, have a look in the patient's notes, find out what investigations they had, why they had those investigations, and what were the results of those investigations. And then you can start to tie it in uh, with diagnoses and um, all your differentials. And the answer is troponin. Troponin I and T. Occlusion of this artery is often called the widow maker due to high mortality. Is it the left circumflex branch, the right coronary artery, the right marginal branch, or the left anterior descending artery? Now, learning your coronary vessels is very important and it also will help you understand why the leads go in the places that they do on ECGs and what leads correspond to what coronary arteries. Okay, and the answer is left anterior descending off. Okay, what is an end STEMI and a STEMI? Okay, my, myocardial infarction is known to most people um, and to patients and lay people, they'll describe it as a heart attack. It is an acute coronary syndrome that comprises of ST elevation. Uh, non ST elevation and unstable angina. Um, and angina pectoris literally means strangling in the chest and describes the discomfort experienced as a result of myocardial ischemia. An MI occurs when there's myocardial necrosis, that's tissue death, following the atherosclerotic plaque rupture, which occurs one or more of the coronary arteries. Atherosclerosis. Uh, is a disease in which plaque builds up inside the artery. Um, it's a slowly progressive disease and it has three stages, so plaque formation, and there's a fibrolipid plaque formation and then complicated atheroma. Um, and atheroma is characterized by the formation of atherosclerotic plaque, which consists of a cholesterol core surrounded by smooth muscle cells. Alteration on the surface of the plaque can lead to intense platelet aggregation and subsequent thrombus formation, then this leads to arterial occlusion. And we will go into that in a bit more detail. So what is the difference between an end STEMI and a STEMI? So the STEMI is a transneural infarction, so it's the all of the myocardial wall. As you can see on the left there, the whole wall of the heart is being affected. And on an S sorry, an ECG it will show as ST elevation. That's the most serious type of MI. 
an N semi and sub endocardial infarction. So necrosis of less than 50% of the myocardial wall, and that will show as an ST compression. So your coronary arteries in an inner myocardial infarction, the left anterior descending artery is known as the widow maker because that's occluded in 40 to 50 percent of cases. And the right coronary artery in 30 to 40 percent of cases, and the left circumflex artery in 15 to 20 percent of cases. So how would you differentiate between acute coronary syndrome? Now it's not always as simple. Um, but if we're looking at it on a on a broad picture, first of all you would look at the ECG. Is there ST segment elevation? Yes. It's likely that it's a semi. If there isn't, you then look at elevated cardiac enzymes. Are they elevated? Is the terminal ele elevated? Yes. And it's N semi. No. Instable angina pectoris. Okay, and unstable angina. Um, is unpredictable and it often occurs at rest. Whereas with stable angina, it will develop on exercise and will ease at rest. That's how you differentiate between those. So the symptoms of an MI is crushing chest pain with pain radiating to the left arm, shoulder, neck or jaw is the most common complaint. And if you take a history from someone who has had an MI, they will often describe it as like an elephant sitting on their chest. Pain usually lasts more than 20 minutes. They can also have nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, sweating and palpitation. Now Levine's sign, there's some debate over this whether it, it uh, you know, the um, specifics of it, but some patients will um, describe the pain by placing a, um, a fist on their chest over their sternum. And then describing the crushing chain. Um, also, patients may complain of shortness of breath, weakness, and fatigue. Now, something you must be aware of is that a silent MI can happen. So, this is a myocardial infarction uh, without any symptoms. So that can happen in diabetes with very elderly patients. So, you don't have to have chest pain to be having an MI. Now the pathophysiology, uh, etiology, um, is myocardial infarction results from lack of oxygen supply to that part of the heart. So you can see the heart muscle, and it's usually due to the blockage of coronary artery that supplies that area. Um, it's caused by the rupture or erosion of an atherosclerotic plaque. Um, and again, as we said before, activation of platelets and coagulation factors results in the formation of a thrombus. You can see the clot there um, on top of the plaque, the ruptured plaque, um, and that's known as an atherothrombosis. So that will either fully uh, occlude in a STEMI or partially occlude uh, in an end STEMI. So once that coronary artery is occluded, Myocardial ischemia, lack of oxygen, um, and necrosis, which you death is going to follow. So atherosclerosis, so you can see at the top you've got your normal artery. In the middle you've got um, atherosclerosis, so that's um, an artery of plaque um, inside the vessel. But you can see the blood is still flowing through. Obviously the patient's at risk of a myocardial infarction, but it's not yet been included. The bottom one is where the plaque is completely occluded to the vessel. No blood is going to get through. The um, heart muscle can't be perfused. No oxygen and nutrients are reaching it. And tissue death is going to follow. Okay. So again, it's just saying that it's very serious. The arteries become clogged with fatty substances and the plaque or papillona. Uh, you're not going to get any oxygen to the heart. Um, and it, it doesn't have any symptoms of first atherosclerosis. Um, but, you know, people walk around with atherosclerosis. Um, it's only when it actually becomes um, the plaque ruptures and then you have um, the occlusion that it will cause either a heart attack or a stroke where the um, atherosclerosis will cover the brain. Sorry, the thrombus will cover the brain. Um, Okay. The most prominent risk factors for MI 
um, our old age. So um, chest pain is a very common complaint to A&E um, and most if not all patients will be given an ECG. It is highly likely um, that it's just an older patient so it's an MI. Um, they will be actively smoking, they will most likely have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, high low density lipoprotein and high triglyceride levels. They have a family history. Um, so they will um, you know, maybe have parents or siblings or close relatives who have had a history of myocardial infarction. Other risk factors um, which male sex, uh, poor diet, obesity, low levels of physical activity, and they'll be exceeding their alcohol use, so they won't be having the usual 14, week, 14 units per week, and they'll be having a lot more than that. So you must make sure that when you take your history, you are asking about lifestyle. Um, most poor and modifiable risk factor for uh, heart attack is smoking, and that includes secondhand smoking. So smoking cessation is absolutely critical, um, and also obesity. So trying to encourage your patients to lose weight healthily and safely and in a way that they can maintain that weight loss um, is really important. So a healthy body mass index is considered to be between 18.5 and 24.9. So on a clinical examination um, and a history, you may have sent the patient to an ECG and it will show either ST elevation, um, so a fully occluded artery, ST depression, so partially, by having inverted T waves, and there might be a, a new left bundle branch block or pathological T waves. Um, now don't worry, that might sound quite frightening and ECG is something that you will practice um, and practice on clinical placement. Again, with permission, have a look at patient ECGs, you go over recognising what a normal ECG looks like and then compare it with um, an abnormal ECG. So blood, look for cardiac biomarkers, so raised levels of troponin, troponin C and I. A chest x-ray may show cardiomegaly, so enlarged heart, pulmonary edema, and widening of the media channel. Angiography might be performed, um, and that's known as PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention. So they use a catheter and they place a stent inside the heart. And then that opens up the blood vessels and, and reproduces the, the, cardi, uh, the cardiac muscle. So again, in, a, in an office situation, remember to ask about lifestyle, smoking, um, you know, how much the patient's drinking, what the diet's like, do they exercise regularly, and ask about family history, any family history of heart attack history, or any heart disease, or angina. ECGs, I put this in for you just to have a look. And um, it's never too early to learn ECG. Do it little and often. When you're on placement, have a look at ECGs. Don't panic. Um, it, it's something that'll come, uh, be second nature soon enough. Um, but if you know where the lead goes, so for like V5, you'll know that that's lateral and that covers the circumflex artery. V3 is anterior, that's going to cover the right coronary artery. It's just getting to know your anatomy, where the leads go, and what they represent. Okay, osteopics. Remember RIP. Raise jugular venous pressure, increase pulse and blood pressure changes, and power and anxiety. So it's a pretty pale, they have like a really grainy look. Levine sign, which we discussed before. The patient may be nauseous, vomiting, breathless, and severe. And remember the sign and power. Right, let's quickly go through these questions that we did before. We can pause. What is the common presentation of a myocardial infarct? And the answer is chest pain or discomfort that may travel into the arm, shoulder, back, neck, or foot. Question two. The pain will be raised. And finally. The left anterior descending artery is more important. Thank you so much for listening and I hope that was useful. Thank you.